This lecture is coming from some of the additional reading that has been provided to you in this course, and it's the title of the chapter is Values and Ethics in Social Work. And as this picture here depicts, a lot of times when it comes to ethics within the social work profession and just dilemmas that you may encounter when you work with individuals, it can be like walking a tightrope where you're trying to keep the balance of what needs to be done, what you feel needs to be done, and what should be done and assessing what's the best decision. So let's get started. I wanted to start off with this cartoon because I find it always is a bit humorous. On the chalkboard, uh, it says, how important are ethics in today's society? And it's assumed that it's a quiz or a test. And you have the one individual in the middle that's writing his answer, and then everyone around him is peeking over his shoulder and cheating. Um, just a, a, a humorous look, but the reality is that unfortunately in our society, uh, mankind can be corrupt, and so there are a lot of unethical things that are taking place. And our roles as social workers are to make sure that we're properly representing ourselves, representing the profession, and representing the clients that we work with to be ethical, and so that way we can give ethical services to those that we work with. So there are several social work values that underpin our ethical principles, and so the first is self-determination. This allows us to explore options with our client and possible outcomes of life choices. Uh, we give up the notion that our personal value system is the model. While we may have wonderful value systems, you might have amazing beliefs and upbringing that makes you who you are. That is you. In the social work realm, though, that is not the model that is going to be followed. And so as we've learned in this course, as you, you have read the solution-focused modality and the, the paradigm shift, this continues to support the view from ethics in social work, where we allow the client to make those decisions and we respect their perspective and we put aside our own ideas and presumptions and preconceptions. We allow the client to make their own decisions and to take responsibility and accept responsibility for those decisions. So this is the ethical value of self-determination. Empowerment, a beautiful value that I, uh, I absolutely love in the social work profession because we are uh, commissioned to work with our clients and be able to empower them so that they can then empower themselves and be able to make the decision that they need so that they no longer need to rely on our services or rely on our help, but they have learned how to be able to help themselves. So it really lays the groundwork also for informed self-determination, where they are educated about what options may exist, they've been able to process it in a safe environment with us, and now they can um, decide their, their options and choose their decisions in an informed way. It also provides opportunities for empowerment, but remember it's a client who must empower themselves to make those choices and to move forward. And knowledge is a fundamental ingredient of empowerment. It truly is power, and so we want to make sure to give our clients the knowledge of the resources that are out there as well as being able to process with them so they can make the best decision. Inherent worth and dignity boils down to R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. Respecting every human being's innate greatness and believing that every human being is innately great. And sometimes that can be very hard to believe when you're working with certain clients. And so making sure that we treat our clients with dignity regardless of what they might be doing, regardless of their behaviors or what they may say. And individualization regards each person as unique, where we're not assuming that we understand a certain person because maybe we've worked with someone that was similar to them in the past, but truly seeing every client as a unique individual, that it is our job to understand and really get a sense as far as who they are. So this sums up inherent worth and dignity, where we believe that every person has a worth and they have the right to feel dignified and then we have the ability to respect their decisions and respect them because they are a human being. And so when it comes to inherent worth and dignity, there are some sticking points. And I know you've probably heard these values hopefully before, whether it's in other previous social work courses or just looking at the NASW Code of Ethics. This is an underpinning to the profession. And so every social worker must be aware of these values because they are what drive our work with clients. And so you will get this information probably in every class, and it just might have a slightly different angle in how you incorporate it. And so be encouraged if these words look familiar, if these values ring a bell in your head, or if you know them automatically, then pat yourself on the back because 
because you want to be able to just spout these off and know what they mean and how they impact your behavior with others. And that's the biggest key is how then does it impact how you relate to other individuals. So when we have clients that maybe they are doing things, they're behaving in ways that might appall or disgust us, and there are things that clients will do, there are behaviors, there are actions they will take that will disgust us. How do you handle that while remaining ethical and making sure that you're respecting and giving inherent worth and dignity to the client? First of all, we want to make sure that we distinguish that we can accept the individual and we can separate the behaviors. So just because this individual is making really awful decisions on how they parent their children, we can still separate the fact that this is still an individual and they're just making bad choices. Oftentimes in my work with children, I would try to reframe whether it was the teacher or the parent or even the child themselves and they would say, I'm a bad kid or that was bad. I would try to reframe it and say, no, you're a good kid. You just made a bad choice, and it's a reframe of separating the choices that may be negative and may be harmful from the person, because it isn't a bad person, it's just a person who is making some negative choices that aren't helpful. So remember that you can distinguish that and learn how to start distinguishing the differences between the individual who has a respect and inherent worth and dignity and the choices that they may be making. However, there are times that you will have someone that you work with that maybe it is difficult, if not impossible, for you to get past the heinousness of the acts, whatever it is that's going on, whatever they've done. Um, you probably can think of populations or groups or certain uh, acts that would be very difficult for you to truly work with that person and respect them as a person. And so when you have that come about, how do you treat them with respect? Because they still need respect. The bottom line is they're a human being and therefore we must respect them even if we may not agree with what's going on and what kind of heinous acts that they have, have committed. So what do you do? That, and when that does happen, here are some tips on what you can do to handle it. Transfer the case to another social worker. Now this isn't our fallback plan. In other words, it isn't our... Um, it isn't ethical for us to just decide, well, I can't work with these types of individuals or I can't work with someone who has these types of issues. And so I'm not even going to try to expand my own bias and work through my own issues and barriers to that population. But instead, I'm just going to transfer them to anybody else that can work with them except for me. And I just won't take anybody who falls into this category. That would be unethical because in a lot of ways, you are then... Um, not allowing services to be provided to that individual and then you're not also allowing yourself to grow and that's the point of what we do as social work. We're constantly learning and growing with our clients and so keep in mind that when I say transfer the case to another social worker this is with the intention when you realize I have to give this person service and in this moment in time I can't move past this and it is truly becoming a barrier where I am not able to effectively and respectfully work with them. When you realize that then transfer the case, but don't just leave it there because then that would be unethical for you to just slough it off, dismiss it, and not keep working on your own issues and what your barriers may be. So transfer the case, talk and consult with your supervisor or another colleague about your feelings so you can process and start working on what what is it about this population, what is it about this kind of issue that is striking a chord with me where I'm not able to truly see this person as a human being that deserves respect. Assess your own values to determine what is getting in the way. What is it that's a barrier to your ability to work with that individual? And then put a plan in place. Maybe your supervisor, a clinical director, or another colleague might be able to help with the accountability piece. So you can put a plan in place on how you can start working through that bias and ask yourself, what about this client or this issue pushes a button in me? And really allow yourself to use your self-awareness and that development of further professional growth from that experience. So don't just transfer and use that as a cop-out because that would be unethical, but if you have to transfer for the sake and for the betterment of the client, do so, but also make sure that you keep working on your issues so that you can grow from the experience as well so you can continue to provide respectful and ethical practice to the other individuals and you can continue to broaden the clientele that you work with. So some social work values as well include confidentiality. This is the ability to keep the, the information that's shared with you by the client uh, confidential, both because you're not going to share it with other people and you're going to document it and 
provide an, uh, a proper security system for the documentation where the files are locked. You're not just leaving them open on your desk. You're not just taking them home so that your family can see the names of your clients. Those kind of pieces that you're keeping the information confidential and you're following the laws on HIPAA and other regulations on documentation as well as information that's shared. Um, so you safeguard that information and you're making sure that your client is aware of what that looks like as well as what are the limits to confidentiality because as you may know we have confidentiality in place except when a child is being hurt or if there's um, this is a, a report of abuse or neglect then we must report that and we are mandated reporters if that is happening also to someone who is elderly then we must also intervene in that manner or if someone is threatening to harm another human being or that they are um, at, at risk to hurt themselves, then we also must break confidentiality. And so making sure that your client is aware and is informed at the beginning of services. In this class, I don't necessarily have you practice that so much because you're going to get that more in practice one and practice two, but know that this is part of our social work value system where we make sure that our clients are aware of what those limits are and we are clear about it. It's not just telling them, it's not just giving them a, a, a form that has all of this uh, legal language that they may not understand, but truly making sure that they get what the limits are. And that will save you in the long run because if you aren't very clear and then you have to report your client, they might come back and say, well, you never told me. And if you didn't properly make sure that they understood, then in a sense, you didn't really tell them. You just jumped through a hoop, but you didn't make sure that they had understood it. So make sure that your client is truly informed and understands the limits of confidentiality. So the NASW Code of Ethics, you've seen this before, the value that underpins service and the principle that accompanies it is helping people in need and to address social problems. The next value is social justice, where we challenge social injustice. The next value is dignity and worth of the person, and we respect the inherent dignity and worth of the person. The next value is importance of human relationships. We recognize how important it is to have these connections and to have a support system. Next one is integrity and we behave in a trustworthy manner, making sure that we are being honest. And the last one is competence, that we practice within our areas of expertise and our competence and we continue to develop and enhance our skill level. Social workers responsible to who? Clients, colleagues, the social work profession, the broader society, the practice setting, and as professionals. Why I bring this up is that sometimes when we, uh, we're about to briefly discuss what an ethical dilemma is, but oftentimes the, the rub will be with an ethical dilemma is because on one hand, what might be good for the client may not be good for the profession, may not be good for colleagues, and may not be good for the broader society, or vice versa. And so know that you aren't just committed to the client for ethical responsibilities, that's one part, but you also are committed to your colleagues, the social work profession as a whole, so you represent not just you, the clinical social work practitioner, but the social work profession as a whole when you perform social work duties. So keep that in mind because there will be some dilemmas that we will be discussing that students in the past have said, well, that works for the client, and they've forgotten to keep in mind the, the aspect of the profession that you represent as well. In discussion of ethics, this chapter does not discuss dual and multiple relationships. However, I find that this topic is incredibly relevant and needed within this topic of ethics, and so I wanted to weave it in, and so this is material that I have from a different source, but I wanted to make sure to give some time, so make sure that you keep note of this since it's not in your reading, but do watch and take in the information that is being discussed that is not included in your text, since you can still be quizzed and I still expect you to understand this information. So when we talk about dual multiple relationships, what it basically means is when that practitioner is involved with that client in a different setting outside of the professional realm. And so, and it's happening simultaneously or consecutively with the professional counseling relationship. So maybe it's um, an, an administrative type of connection or instructional or supervisory or social, sexual, or business. An example would be if you're a counselor and you are seeing a caseload of clients and one of your clients happens to be a personal trainer at the gym in whose membership you have. And so you go there and then you see your client outside of your counseling setting and it's more of like this personal, uh, non-professional role. And so this is what we mean when we talk about dual multiple relationships. And sometimes it just might mean that you have dual would be 
you see them at the gym and then you see them in your session and those are just two. Multiple might be that you might see them there and then they're also a member at your church. And so you can see how this can get very complicated quickly when we're not careful with how we manage our connections with our clients that are professional as well as what it might look like if we have any type of personal overlap. So some such relationships can lead to the counselor's objectivity being reduced, where now because you're seeing your client in a different setting, or maybe you're um, you're accessing different information pieces about your client because of that connection you have in that personal realm, it can make your objectivity get a bit uh, weakened. And so be aware of that. Also know that it can weaken and confuse the relationship with your client because now you've got this murky water in this gray area where it's not necessarily a professional context, but then you've got these connections and this um, ability to connect with your client in a, a personal way that might confuse the issue at hand when they come to see you in session. It also puts the client in a position of diminished consent and potential abandonment. When you think about it, now you're accessing and you're maybe observing or you're connecting with them outside of session, which gives you a lot more information than maybe the client may want you to have. And so that might feel like you're accessing things without their permission and their consent is being diminished and they're not able to truly be a part of that and gatekeep how much you do or don't know about them. It also can lead to abandonment if your client starts to feel very connected to you because you are their counselor and you're also serving on this committee and you also attend their gym and you attend their church, that then if for some reason you uh, services are discontinued or you leave, that client can feel abandoned because now they've built this connection that's much deeper and much more complex than just the professional connection. It can foster discomfort. Clearly, if you see your client and they see you in, in the gym, that's a different realm than maybe that might be comfortable for them. And it can also expose a client and practitioner to some negative judgments or responses by others. If you are your client's counselor and then they are your personal trainer, most of your colleagues that are aware of that would probably frown on that type of connection and would feel that that was an inappropriate use of the relationships and connections with your clients. So, as much as possible, Professional helpers should avoid becoming involved in dual or multiple relationships with clients. There are some individuals that have refined this skill and have maybe exploited clients. For example, what if your client is a real estate broker and she is a phenomenal real estate broker and you just happen to be in the market of selling your home or maybe trying to rent or find another real estate property? Some Social workers might think that it's not a bad deal and it actually gives more job opportunities to your client if you become their client in the real estate setting. Now, some of you might immediately jump to the, the realization that that could get very complex because what if the realtor doesn't sell your home the right way? What if something happens and the business deal goes bad and now you have them as a client and you are technically their client as well? And then how does that impact that counseling session where now they might come to you to speak about their issues, but they might get sidetracked to give you an update on your house or the listing or showing it and so on and so forth. And so you can see how things can get very convoluted quickly. And it can also make the client feel that they're put in a position that is very awkward because if things don't go well, now they've disappointed their therapist. Or if things go very well, now they might feel like now you can continue giving them business or giving them business referrals, which further blends some of those boundaries that we're about to talk more about. So we try to avoid those dual multiple relationships as much as possible. However, there are some realities where sometimes we just can't quite escape it. Uh, there's been times where I've been at a Christian concert and there are my there's my client and her family and I didn't go and sit with them. I didn't um, even acknowledge them because my clients knew that I, if I saw you in a social setting, if I saw you outside of the counseling office, unless you approached me first, I would not approach the client just to make sure that I was respecting confidentiality. But sometimes if you live in a small town, or maybe based on the affiliations that you may have, sometimes church counselors may find that this is a very difficult thing to navigate because you're a member of that church and then you're also providing services, so you're naturally going to have some of your the other members that are part of that church congregation that are also your clients. And so Sometimes it's unavoidable. But here's the thing, as helpers and as social workers, we should be active in our community and we should be considered a member of that community and involved. If we're not, if we try to just stay within our own home and never connect with anyone outside in the community in fear of connecting with clients accidentally, 
then we actually miss a part of our ability to be in touch and to be seen as a professional that's a networking agent within the community. So it's a positive thing to be to be active in your community. And sometimes, I know this might sound a bit contradictory, but sometimes interactions with clients outside of therapy can actually be helpful and it might even be advisable. Um, now you have to be very careful with this and whenever you're approached with something like this you always want to consult and make sure you've double checked yourself with your supervisor and some other colleagues within the field. But here's an example. Let's say you've been working with a single mom for the past few years in counseling and her goal was to finish her college degree and she sees you as a key component of someone who has helped in that process for her to achieve that goal. She's coming up on a graduation and she gives you an invitation because she'd like you to be there because she really honors the fact that you have been a helpful process, person in that process. Now, attending that graduation would be actually very appropriate because that was an active part of your goals. So it's almost like a celebration of her accomplishment of her goals. It can directly connects with her work with you. It's not something that's personal and outside of the realm of your work with your client. And so that would be an example of how it's a personal event, but yet it does connect professionally with your work with your client. Now, if your client was having a barbecue with her family and she was going to rent a boat and she wanted you to be a part of that, now that's where I would draw the line and say, no, this doesn't really necessarily support what that client's goal was. But in this case, with a, her graduating, that would be an appropriate thing to attend. So keep in mind, there will be some questions that might come up along the way in a future quiz or an exam on what makes it a professional and an okay type of interaction outside of the professional context and what might make it uh, inappropriate. And keep in mind you want to make sure the client initiates that contact with you first and that you can give reason and other professionals would understand your reason as to why you would attend that event or connect with that client outside of your work with them. Some other examples might be if you're on an advocacy board, uh, children's advocacy, and you might have a mother of one of your clients that might be also part of that because of her connection. And so those kind of professional connections um, may happen and sometimes they are very helpful to the, the helping process. But there are times when there are inappropriate boundaries and that is a very clear thing. And as you continue to develop your professional self, continue to develop what your boundaries look like both for you personally as well as professionally. Engaging in a sexual or a romantic relationship with a current or former client, so even someone you worked with three years ago, um, is considered an inappropriate boundary. Now let me ask you, when can a social worker engage in this kind of relationship with their client? Maybe you, you worked with a client five years ago and now five years have passed and there's this romantic connection. When can you actually engage in that more personal romantic sexual relationship? I'm hoping you all said never, never. Other counseling entities and boards might say different. They might give a five-year or seven-year time span, but the NASW Code of Ethics is very clear, and it states that you should never engage in this type of relationship. And my thought behind this is that on a personal side of things, I don't know if I want to tell family and friends that the way that I met my husband or my um, my significant others because they were a former client of mine and I was work helping them work through their issues. Uh, depending on what you were helping them work through, that might set up this codependent type of romantic relationship just from the get-go because of the different roles that you had when you were their counselor. Um, but aside from that, that's my personal perspective on thinking that it just is a clear-cut uh, issue. But for some, it might be blurry, and so just remind yourself that never should you ever engage in a personal sexual romantic relationship with a client or even a former client. That is just NASW code. Don't violate it. It could mean the rest of your career, and so don't even mess with it. Just stay very clear-cut and keep those boundaries clear. So ethical dilemma is defined as when you, the social worker practitioner, is trying to satisfy the demands of two, or I would say, or even more, competing value systems, an ethical dilemma may result. And so it's not just a tough decision, because we will make tough decisions many, many, many times in our careers, but it's when there's those gray areas and when there's two competing values and you really... It, it could go either way because there's so many benefits to both options and yet there's also some negative aspects to both options. So because these are gray areas, that's why they're called a dilemma. 
It's not a tough choice because a choice that's tough, you can just make it. It's a dilemma because you are caught in the middle of something and you're having to weigh and wrestle and make sure you're on the right track. Consult, consult, consult. Don't do, don't make decisions on these ethical dilemmas on your own. The more you can have other individuals involved, the more likely you can double check yourself in making sure that you are doing the right thing. The way the social work profession works is that if there is some kind of malpractice or some kind of legal suit that, that results as part of a social worker's decision, oftentimes they will use a panel of other social workers in the profession that can assess whether or not they would have made the same choice. And so when you think about it in that way, that means the more you consult with other people within the profession and your supervisors and colleagues, et cetera, to make sure that your decision is appropriate, the more likely that your decision would be appropriate. And even if a legal suit was to happen, the jury of your peers would still find your decision to be sound. And so that's why we consult. Don't do things alone. Don't try to be the lone ranger or the hero, but make sure that other people are in the loop, that you've connected the right individuals with your decision, and so that way it's a team approach to those dilemmas that you will face, and you will face them. So know how to face them and make sure that you're not alone. So before we review some ethical dilemmas so that you can process and analyze what makes them okay or what would be some courses of action that you would take if you were the social worker involved, um, I wanted to show this ethical decision-making model, and it's not included in your text. This is another supplemental resource that I am including in this lecture, so you won't find it in print in your text, but please make sure that you just have an awareness of what this looks like. I am not concerned that you know all the steps at this point because it really is something that you can refer to in the future, but just know that this is one of the ways that you can handle ethical dilemmas so that as we move into that discussion part of this lecture and in our course and our classwork you will have an idea of how to process what you should do. So here it is and it's a lot of words so we'll walk through it. Step one is describing the issue and when you look at the right column considerations to be addressed would include who's involved, well, how are they involved, what is involved, uh, what's the dilemma and what's at risk and what are the relevant situational features. Um, the second one is considering the ethical guidelines. So looking at your ethical guidelines from the NASW Code of Ethics, what are the ones that you need to consider? What are your own personal values that might relate to this situation as well as those that are related to the ethical code of, or the code of ethics? Um, what society or community values play into it or professional standards, laws, and regulations? So look at those and then we're going to move into applying those guidelines. Step three is examine the conflicts because that's what makes it a dilemma is that things are in conflict with each other. So describe those conflicts that you're experiencing internally. Uh, that's what makes them so challenging is that they are something that's personal to you, something that you are struggling with, and then be able to describe what you're experiencing that are external and decide whether or not you can minimize any of those conflicts. Um, Step four deals with resolving conflicts. So seeking assistance, as I've mentioned before, consult, consult, consult with fa colleagues, faculty, supervisors, review professional literature, do your own research to find um, information that might be helpful to your dilemma, and then seek consultation from professional organizations. Uh, I have had times in my past where I've had things that have come across that I wanted to make sure I was acting ethically or I was concerned with an ethical practice or mispractice that my agency was doing. And so I contacted the local NS NASW and I was able to talk with them about the situation and get from their perspective any things that I may have missed and any other actions that I may need to take. And that was very helpful to remember that you have that professional organization to consult with. Number five is generate action alternatives. So considering the clients and other participants and what their understanding is as well as what are the, all the possible courses of action. So brainstorm and figure out what are those different things you can do and then eliminate anything that's going to be inconsistent with the client or their beliefs, values, and things that are just obviously not going to work. Step six, you then examine and evaluate those, alt those action alternatives and again eliminate anything that is inconsistent with relevant guidelines and then anything that may not be available because of resources or lack of support and eliminate any remaining action alternatives that don't pass the test on ethical principles. Um, so again, if you're looking at the code of ethics, and if you're also cross-checking that with some of your colleagues in the field, that will help make sure that you're staying on track and the litmus test is, is staying true. Um, number seven, you're going to select and evaluate your preferred action. So after you've 
pull out all your alternatives, you've pulled out the ones that are not going to work for whatever reasons, and now you've left with just the last few that are might be available, then you're going to select and evaluate which one is going to be the best. Plan how you're going to execute it, which is step eight. Evaluate the outcome, which is once you've already done it, how, what outcome is occurring? What's the client reaction? and how, how did the scenario play out? And then step 10 is examine the implications. What have you learned? Are there any implications for future ethical decisions that you might have to come across? So this is just a, a detailed step-by-step -step process of how you handle ethical um, dilemmas and what the process will be. Make sure to refer to this as we look at some of the other uh, dilemmas in a short bit and then we'll go from there. The next few slides are some ethical dilemmas that I want you to read uh, because everyone's pacing of reading might be different and I want to make sure you can really think about it. What I will do is we're going to just briefly go through the dilemma. I'm going to overview it and then there are some questions. After this presentation times out, you can go back to these slides and just watch them without the sound. So you can watch it in a non-presentation view or not slides to show view. And that way you can read it at your pace. But please make sure you read these because we will be discussing them and using them uh, further. And I need to make sure that you have the background. So Gary's a social worker at a child guidance clinic who's assigned to provide consultation for a chain of group homes for severely emotionally disturbed children and adolescents. Gary returned home from work one night to find that a friend of his 11-year-old daughter Sally would be sleeping over. When he met Sally's new friend Gail, he realized she was a former resident of one of the group homes where he is a consultant. So there are a series of questions there. If Sally's friendship um, with Gail creates an ethical dilemma for Gary, if it's not, figure out why. If it is, figure out why. And then go through those questions as well. So again, because these take some thought, I'll let you come back to this later and go through these questions and analyze your thinking and reflect back on the previous part of this lecture where we're going through the ethical values. Look at the NASW Code of Ethics that we reviewed and remember your ethical responsibilities, not just to the client, but to the profession, to your colleagues, and to the broader society as well as to the profession and the practice that you're working in. So keep this in mind and come back to these questions in a bit. Here's the next one. Juan and Jim. Juan is a counselor in a program for street kids. Because his clients are frequently reluctant to seek services and often distrust professional, he prefers to work outside the box, relating to them more casually and skipping some of those formalities of counseling sessions. As such, he usually doesn't discuss confidentiality and the limits of it at the outset of service, even though such discussions are considered to be important to the client knows how information may be used, and can judge accordingly what he or she wants to share. Juan recently began working with Jim, encouraging Jim to find stable housing and a less self-destructive lifestyle, and one day, Jim told Juan that he is HIV positive and feels his life is over. Even though he says he loves his girlfriend, Karen, he refuses to tell her of his status, fearing that he will scare away the only good thing in my life right now. In a state where Juan practices, professionals are required to report situations such as Jim's to the public health authorities so that the partner at risk can be notified. However, Juan's failure to inform Jim of this possibility means that Jim shared the information with Juan without understanding the potential consequences. Is Juan's behavior ethical? And the rest of the questions you can review at the end of this presentation. Or you can pause this presentation um, now and think through these questions. There are a few different ways you can go about it. But go ahead and process this and think through another angle of ethical dilemmas. Here's the next one, Kathy and New Beginnings. New Beginnings is a private child welfare agency that contracts with the State Department of Social Services to facilitate adoptions for hard-to-place youth. Kathy, a new worker at the agency, has raised questions about two of the strategies New Beginnings used to reach out to potential adoptive families. In particular, she is troubled by advertisements placed in the local paper that provide pictures of the youth that are up for adoption, their first names, ages, and profiles, including their interests and special needs. She has also raised concerns about open houses or fairs at which adoptive couples are introduced to and mingle with children who have been placed for adoption. After attending her first open house, Kathy voiced her objections at a staff meeting, equating the experience to a meat market where vulnerable children were being given a high stakes once over in hopes of adoption. The staff assured Kathy that New Beginnings was not unique in using these strategies and that they were ultimately in the best interest of the child. Is Kathy's behavior ethical? Why? Why not? explain. You can pause this presentation and read the rest of the questions and think through on what your answer would be. And I've actually seen in local news 
a similar type of concept where a child who needs a foster home or who needs an adoptive home is is uh, interviewed and their photo is being shown on the newscast. And so it's a, it's a very relevant, real thing that happens in certain states and parts of the country where this type of practice is used to promote adoptive parents. So think about that and you can pause the presentation now to read the rest of the questions. Tanya and Randy. Tanya and Randy are both 28 years old. They both work part-time. They both live in the Midwest and they both were born with Down syndrome. They've been married for several years and are eager to start a family. They are aware of their limitations but are confident in their ability as a team to successfully raise their children. During a recent meeting, Tanya confided in Vanessa, their caseworker, her concern about their inability to conceive and asked for help in accessing resources to pursue fertility treatments. Privately, Vanessa cringed. While she respected Tanya and Ron Randy's abilities and dedication to each other, her previous work in child protection had left her very discouraged about the capacity of most people, much less those with the limitations Randy and Tanya have, to parent effectively. In responding to Tanya's request for assistance, Vanessa decides to contact a physician who shares her views and who will not actively assist the couple with their quest to have children. She is reluctant to deceive her clients, but believes she is acting in their long-term best interest. Is Vanessa's behavior ethical? Yes, no, you can pause this presentation now and reflect on those questions. A final thought that was in the reading that I love. All people are inherently great, it's just that some have forgotten. And I love this statement and I think this is true of us as our work in social work where we work with individuals that truly have forgotten that they are great. They have some great things about them. And whether we're working with them in a clinical setting or another capacity in social work, it's our job to help work with them in an ethical ways to remind them that they are great. And it's good for us to remember when we see the disparity and the awful decisions that maybe some of our clients may make, that we remind ourselves that all people are inherently great and it's just that some have forgotten. And when we forget that we have some greatness in us, it leads us to possibly make other decisions that aren't very great. So keep this in mind as you work with individuals and embrace and respect uh, the individuals that they are because they are inherently great. That's all for this e-lecture. Thanks for staying by. I look forward to discussing this further as we process ethical dilemmas.